Hello, this is Malcolm Tivitz with another segmented wood turning project video. Over the years, I've produced a lot of work using tapered rings, tapered rings like you see here in these two donuts behind me. Here are a few more examples of segmented work that involved tapered rings. In recent months, our family has been blessed with the addition of two new grandsons. The miracle of life, the miracle of life creation acted as the inspiration for this project. That'll make a lot more sense if you watch the entire video to its end. I apologize for the length of the video. Uh, this is not a short how to turn a bowl video. This project has so many steps uh, that require some level of explanation. If you're into segmented wood turning, I hope you can pick up a few tips. Uh, if you're not, well, uh, enjoy anyway. As with any project, it starts with milling the material. Here I've machined five different colors of wood. They're about eight tenths of an inch uh, wide and uh, about half an inch thick. Using my miter saw, I'll cut five segments at a time. I've got to cut thousands and thousands of these segments and then I'll proceed to glue them together into very small rings about two and a half inches in diameter. I have perfect angles. I'm gluing these in one step, 15 segments at a time, using three or four rubber bands uh, as pressure. This is a very tedious, uh, laborious you know, part of the project. I've created a gluing list. I need a total of 750 rings, 150 of each uh, color, uh, but they're mixed colors. Uh, this is very time consuming, a uh, lot of labor, but it had to be done. So here are my 750 rings, but what I really need for the project is 1500 rings. So I'll proceed to split these using my bandsaw. Splitting round rings on a bandsaw requires a, a special tool, something to secure these so they can't be spun by the blade. Uh, you can't just hand hold these and cut them. So one after the other, I take my 750 rings, split them into 1500 rings. This takes a little time and effort, but it's certainly much faster than having to glue up a total of 1500 rings. These rings were all previously sanded on one side before they were split. They've got a smooth, uh, gluable surface on one side. Now I need to mount them on trays of melamine, just boards, with quarter-inch wide strips of double-sided tape. I'll clean off all the dust, mount them on the tape, and then make multiple passes. Uh, 36 grit paper is what I'll start with. I need to get these to a certain thickness, and I need to get them smooth enough uh, for uh, gluing. The, uh, the final uh, passes will be done with 80 grit, so I'll have to change my paper. Removing the rings from the double-sided tape is kind of tricky. They're fairly fragile. Uh, they're easily broken if you're not uh, real careful. Now my 1500 rings have all been sanded. 500 of them are thinner than the other thousand. I need to pair these up into groups of three. I'm going to be gluing them together to, uh, to make one assembly. You can see the different thicknesses here. Before gluing, they've got to be dust free. It's where an air compressor comes in pretty handy. My next chore is to convert those 1500 rings into 500 uh, rings stacks of three. I can do them uh, three at a time with two glue joints. Four spring clamps provides plenty of pressure. This is where it really does pay to own a lot of clamps. I need to turn all those rings round and smooth consistent diameter. To do that I'm going to drill out the centers. I'm only really removing some glue squeeze out here. This will allow me to put them on the lathe ten at a time. So with them drilled, I'll go to the lathe and create a, a, a spindle, an arbor, if you will, to uh, put these on and 
The key to the turning is the cap that goes on the end, the tailstock end. It fits over my spindle uh, with enough uh, recess so I can apply pressure onto those ten rings. The rings are centered, they don't slip, I can turn them to a consistent diameter, I can sand them, uh, and uh, this is so much faster than doing them one at a time. You may have noticed the use of a cabinet scraper. This is just a straight edge card scraper. I routinely use this uh, just before my first sanding. It gives a finish probably the equivalent of about 180 grit. Well, it allows me to start sanding with 220 grit. So 500 rings, all turned same diameter, smooth, uh, ready for the next step. The next step is where things start to get a little trickier. So what is that next step? Well, all these rings need to be joined together in groups of five. They're going to be connected to each other using a 1 16th inch diameter dowel. That requires two holes to be drilled in each one of these rings. I need a jig or a template or whatever you want to call this, an aid, in order to uh, put these together in a consistent uh, configuration. So here I've created my first template, you know, some work at the drill press, some work at the lathe, and uh, then I'll use a pattern bit on a router and uh, create a few more of these so, you know, so I have more than one. Next, uh, a little bit more router work. I want a rounded edge on one side of my uh, jigs. And then it's time to start putting these together. I've got all my rings drilled. They've got two holes and they've got one side marked so they're consistently uh, positioned as they would you know, put on the drill press when the holes were drilled. All these rings are eventually going to form five tubes. So I'm playing around with the arrangement of the colors and then marking them so that uh, I create the uh, image that uh, I have in my mind. I'm going to use little 16th inch dowels. These have been pre-stained dark, they're almost black, and I'll put uh, one dowel in one hole on one side of all of these. To avoid glue squeeze out on the outside of my rings, I'm inserting glue using a bent piece of steel, uh, inserting the glue from the inside surface. So I'll put one dowel in one side of all of my rings. Here are a few more rings that have had the single piece of dowel uh, glued in place. Now it's time to uh, assemble these in groups of five. I'll put glue in each one of the five other holes, uh, insert uh, them together with the dowel that's already been put in place, and use my little template to position these into a consistent uh, position. Eventually, my 500 rings will give me 100 assemblies of five. This project has many, many steps, and there are many, many more to go. Now that I've got my 100 assemblies of five, I need to start treating these as if they were one ring. I'm going to taper my rings now using the trays of melamine with the shim under one edge. The shim will be dimensioned uh, by running it through the drum sander to get me the right thickness so that I can create the needed taper on my rings. The rings have to be quite accurately positioned so I'm putting a series of you know markings, lines that I can line up with and I've created myself an index wheel that I can use to position the rings rotationally. So each ring gets its own little marking, its own little circle. It's got marks that I can line up the rotational position on both sides, because I'll be flipping these over and taping the other side, which will require a mirror image position. Now I have to accurately position these rings on my trays. Normally I would use double-sided tape, but that makes it too difficult to really slide them around a little bit. So. Once I've got them in position, I'll use uh, hot melt glue 
five little dabs of hot melt glue will hold these in place with no problem. And then it's multiple passes through the drum sander, 36 grit paper to start, and finishing it off with 120 grit. This is a slow process. It takes a lot of passes to remove that much wood, but I don't know of another way to do it any faster. Removing the rings is a real hassle. I'm using a hot uh, linoleum knife. I keep putting it into the flame of my little torch there, and the hot blade cuts through the uh, hot melt much easier than I could do it any other way. Before removal, I need to put the numbers back on so that I can put them back on the trays uh, in a mirror image you know, to taper the other side. I've cleaned up the trays, removed the initial uh, shim, and now putting a second shim on, one that's about twice as tall as the uh, first shims were. Determining the thickness or the height of that last second uh, shim requires a little bit of arithmetic. I'll walk you through it. I know my ring thicknesses, the you know outside thickness. I know the number of rings. In this case, it'll be 100. I, I can calculate the circumference by multiplying those. I can figure out my outer diameter by dividing the circumference by pi. To calculate the inside diameter of this donut, I'll take two times the, the diameter of my ring, which is a little over eight inches, subtract that from my outer diameter, and that gives me my inner diameter. Multiplying the inner diameter by pi, 3.1416, gives me an inside circumference. And then dividing that by the number of rings, the 100, gives me the thickness of the inside of my tapered rings. Now if I take my outer ring thickness and subtract my inner ring thickness, I'll get a difference and that equals the height of my shim on my second passes. I went through that pretty fast. Here's an Excel sheet that shows the numbers if you want to look at it a little more closely. With my shims dimensioned, it's now time to flip these over. I've got reference marks. I'll flip them over in a mirror image uh, position so I can taper the other side to get the complete taper that I need. Now it's another session of tapering, many, many passes through the drum sander. Before removing these, I want to put reference marks so I know exactly how they should be aligned to one another. And my center lines are in space in many cases. So I'm installing some little strips of tape where I can put a mark which is out in space. This will assist me later on when I start to uh, attach these to each other. Before proceeding, I want to check my angles. There are 100 angles. 10 of them should equal 36 degrees, 360 divided by 10. So I've got this uh, little angled board which allows me to stack 10 and check the angle. Looks pretty good. Now for the fun part of the project. I'm going to stack these and drill holes. I'll be connecting all these to each other with number four wood screws. I've got a little device I've created here that will clamp them together, hold them securely while I drill holes. Each ring will require ten holes to be drilled, two in each ring. And then uh, before I proceed to the next ring, I'll need to countersink those for the screw heads. And I'll need to enlarge the initial hole uh, for the uh, diameter of the screw shanks. Before assembling, there's a few more steps. I need to round all those sharp edges. This is just a very small 1 16th inch uh, rubber bit, rounding bit. And then uh, the areas where the dowels are, they need to be manually uh, rounded off. I can't get the rotor bit there. A little cleanup with a sanding mop and get them all ready to spray their first coat of finish. After a little cleanup with compressed air, I'll start the finishing process. First, many coats of gloss lacquer, uh, buff between coats. 
I used a variety of number four screws, various lengths from three quarter to inch and a half. And this is kind of just a step at a time process, screwing these things together, checking for nice tight fits. And occasionally I'd go to the disc sander and just touch them to make sure they stay nice and flat. You might be wondering why I didn't glue things together and why did I go to the trouble of all that uh, wood screw work. I didn't want to deal with glue squeeze out. I did a dry fit at this stage of the project, confirmed my angles, but unfortunately also confirmed that my twist was going to be off. I was going to miss the last connection by well over an inch. I knew going into the project that getting that twist to come around perfectly was going to be very difficult, probably going to require a little bit of luck. But I had a backup plan. If the twist on the torus didn't work, I could always put these elements together uh, into a tower. So that's what I did. A tower was going to require a different type of base, so I constructed these rings. Then I tapered them, glued them together into a kind of an elbow, uh, a little sanding, and there was part of my base. As much as I like the natural look of wood, for a base, I want it to be black. I don't want it to draw the eye away from the tower. I'm using India ink, making the uh, elbow black and the base plate uh, after it's been sanded, that will be black as well. At the top of the elbow, there's a disc of wood that needs to be attached. I'm going to use screws to do that, and I'll need to plug the uh, screw holes with these little ebony plugs. The top of my five tubes are hollow, so I'm turning some little cabochons of five various woods to uh, cover those uh, openings. For my final finish, I'm using some deaf semi-gloss. Just take some of the shine off the object. So why did I title this piece Tower of Life? Well, I'm no expert in genetics, the whole field of chromosomes and DNA and all that, but the assembly to me had a slight resemblance to a strand of DNA. And when it comes to chromosomes, most people are familiar with the concept of all our characteristics being determined by 23 pair of chromosomes. So here's what I've done. I've used the five colors of man, white, black, brown, yellow, and red. But uh, perhaps uh, more importantly, I've incorporated the number 23 into my project. Each individual ring is made up of three layers of 15 segments for a total of 45. Add in the one dowel that connects, that's 46, uh, otherwise known as 23 pair. So that uh, ties in with my theme. Additionally, all the segments in the tower, the 500 assemblies of 45 segments, well that totals 22,500. Add in the 500 dowels and magically we have 23,000 pieces of wood in the tower. 23 being the significant number. For more on segmented wood turning, I invite you to check out my website, tahoeturner.com.